there is a lot of buzz right now about how these new GLP-1 agonist drugs, the ones that are used to treat uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity, are actually helping people improve their addictions. So some people are saying that Ozempic that they're taking or the Manjaro that they're taking is reducing their cravings for alcohol, reducing their cravings for cigarettes and vaping, reducing their nail biting, reducing their desire to go on shopping sprees. For example, this woman who lost 60 pounds after taking Wegovy, she noticed that she was no longer wanting to drink alcohol. So can Ozempic and or Manjaro actually cure addiction or at least improve it? We're hearing all sorts of stories of people quitting their addictions, whether it's alcohol or sugar or something else. But so far, it's mostly been anecdotal evidence. Maybe we shouldn't be surprised by this because we know that the GLP-1 hormone, as well as the GIP hormone, as is the case of Manjaro, acts on the brain to reduce cravings. In fact, we know that there are GLP-1 receptors that are in the different regions of the brain that are involved in the reward and addiction pathway. So what does the science say? There was a recent study done in rats who were addicted to cocaine. The findings indicated that the increased activation of GLP-1 receptors in the nucleus accumbens, the NAC, the nucleus accumbens of the brain, that led to reduced cocaine-seeking behavior. Now, in these studies, when the GLP-1 receptor drug ezenatide was given to mice and when it was direct, directly injected into the brain, specifically the VTA or the ventral tegmental area, the rats took less cocaine. So ezenatide, which is a GLP-1 agonist, it also seemed to control behaviors in rats that mimic the craving for cocaine, such as lever pressing that had been associated with getting that cocaine. It's also been observed that ezenatide can calm down the heightened activity that cocaine can cause in mice and reduce the release of dopamine that is part of the brain's reward system. Other studies have also been done in rodents and non-human primates like uh, monkeys, which have demonstrated a reduction in alcohol intake. For example, here's a study showing reduced alcohol dependence in rodents after they were given ezenatide, and there were similar results when they used another GLP-1 agonist, liraglutide. Another study showed that once weekly injections of the long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist, dulaglutide, for five to nine weeks, that decreased alcohol intake in both male and female rats with no indication of tolerance. Now, other studies showed similar findings in monkeys. So what about humans? Right now, there's at least two randomized clinical trials that are investigating the effects of GLP-1 receptor agonist on alcohol intake in heavy drinkers or patients diagnosed with AUD, alcohol use disorder. One study suggested that ezenatide could help people quit smoking and reduce their cravings for nicotine. So more studies in humans, they're coming, and we should have answers soon. The dopamine system and reward circuitry is one of the main systems that's involved in addiction. When a person uses an addictive substance, the substance often stimulates the release of dopamine, a neurotransmitter, in certain regions of the brain, like the nucleus accumbens, which is part of the ventral striatum. This leads to feelings of pleasure or reward. Over time, with repeated exposure, the brain adapts to the excessive dopamine signaling, reducing its sensitivity, which can lead to tolerance, which means they require more of the same substance to get that same effect. And they also get withdrawal symptoms when that substance is not present. Now, there are many types of addictions, including sugar. Addiction is also associated with changes in brain structure and function, and this is known as neuroplasticity. This can include changes in the number or the strength of connections between neurons, known as synapses, or alterations in the levels of certain neurotransmitters or their receptors. Now, these changes can influence patterns of behavior that are associated with addiction, including cravings, compulsive use of that substance, and difficulty quitting despite the negative consequences associated with that addiction. The prefrontal cortex has connections with the striatum, which is crucial for cognitive control and decision-making. The prefrontal cortex, so this part of your brain right here, has connections with the striatum, which is crucial for cognitive control and decision-making. Addiction can alter the functioning of the prefrontal cortex in ways that decrease that self-control and increase impulsivity. 
This can make it more difficult for someone struggling with addiction to resist the urge to use the substance even when they know that it's harmful to them. Chronic substance use can also affect the brain's stress systems, including the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary axis. This can make individuals more susceptible to stress, which in turn can increase cravings and the risk of relapsing. The hippocampus and amygdala are parts of the brain involved in learning and memory, but they also play a role in addiction. They help form associations between drug use and certain cues or contexts, which can trigger cravings and relapse even after long periods of abstinence. Different substances have different mechanisms of action and can affect the brain in unique ways, but many of these general principles apply across different types of addiction. That's why cross addiction is a thing, meaning once you give up one addiction, you pick up another. And we all have differences in our genetics, in our epigenetics, and our environment, which can also influence a person's susceptibility to addiction and their response to treatment. Now, many scientists believe that those who struggle with obesity and those who struggle with addiction have overlapping dysfunction of certain brain pathways. And we still don't completely understand how these GLP-1 agonists specifically work on addiction-related issues, but it seems like they work, at least in part, by affecting the neurons involved in dopamine secretion. For example, the GIP hormone and GLP-1 hormone also act as neurotransmitters in the brain. They're actually made not only in the small intestine, but these are made in the brain, and then they act as neurotransmitters to go to other parts of the brain and communicating with other neurons. So it's more than just a hormone that's made in the intestines. It's actually made in the brain, communicates with other parts of the brain, and this is what's disrupting the pattern in people with obesity who, have, who struggle with the cravings and they're trying to lose weight. It actually interrupts somewhere in that pathway, and that's why they get less cravings and they end up eating less. How it exactly works still hasn't been defined yet. So it's important to note that the evidence suggesting these GLP-1 stimulating drugs could be beneficial hasn't really been tested in humans yet, except for two small studies. But it does look like, anecdotally speaking, it looks like it does help curve or help improve addictions, but more and more studies are coming soon.